I mentioned a um, couple of weeks ago um, a story from back in the day when I uh, was at the Victoria Police Academy. Little did I know that over those years, really, I was simply accumulating stories that would would kind of serve my my preaching um, for for years for years later. On this one one occasion, it was um, it was as I was resigning actually to to go to Bible college, and and the process of resignation was a bit of a strange one. Um, but but slowly, you kind of handed back all of the all of the little goodies that they had given you, your uniform and so forth. And so it was that I had to uh, sign some paperwork in at the, the head office. Now, over, over my, my short but illustrious career, I had lots of ideas as a lowly young constable. I kind of thought, oh, you know what? They could do this and they could do that and, and so on. All these ideas, wonderful ideas, but who do you tell? Uh, the system was such with military bureaucracy that that really you know you really couldn't pass messages all that far up the um the ranks well anyway on my very or one of my very last days as i went into the william street office in those days to to sign some paperwork i'd already handed back my uniform and i'd already already handed back uh, my my badge i i really had no identification um, that I was actually a, a police officer. I was just in plain clothes. I actually, <laughs> I remember it was feeling a little bit, a little bit strange. I actually still had my gun, um, but I had no identification, which was a bit odd. But anyway, I was in the um, in the headquarters, and I actually had to to go up to this this particular level. I actually had to get a visitor's badge, which was kind of you know, it was, I don't know, it was a little bit humbling. And so I had this visitor's badge, and I hopped into the lift, and there in the lift, alone. A captive audience was the chief commissioner of police, Cal Glare. And, uh, and the door shut, and I recognized instantly who he was. And I was thinking, well, normally, you know, I'd, I'd probably salute him. And this is really odd, but here I am just in plain clothes with a visitor's badge, and it was just kind of really, really awkward. And then I thought to myself, this is my moment. I've had all of these amazing ideas that, that could you know, could help Cal with his job. And, and, and now here we are, and maybe I'm not even bound by the normal rules of, rules of protocol and so forth. But without any identification, all of a sudden I had this, 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 this identity crisis. And I kind of thought I could start, and he would just look at me and say, well, who are you? And, and I had this sudden loss of confidence. And you know what? I, I, I didn't say a thing. I lost my moment. Well, I imagine that for the Apostle Paul, this, this might have been a little bit what he was, he was thinking. He had heard word from the Corinthian church, hey, since you came, we've been introduced to all these other great teachers, super apostles, charismatic people with, with wonderful new ideas, much easier than the old ideas that you had. Paul, who are you? And he was getting word back that, that he was being questioned. He was seen as a rather unimpressive figure and so forth. And, and Paul, I guess, could have been forgiven for having a little bit of an identity crisis, for having a, a loss of confidence. You know, it's really, really important that who you are is not determined by others, that you are able to lock down who you are in Christ. And, and Paul, of course, is able to do that, and he shows us how. In the passage that we're looking at, or the chapters we're looking at in 2 Corinthians at the moment, we're, we're trying to understand what it means, of course, to be envoys of grace. That's the E in abide, eh? is, is that in order to abide, well, it's a, it's a communal thing. We do it all together. B is to take time to be still. I, to imitate Christ. D, our devotion to one another. And E, envoys of grace, the missional component, if you like, of, of abiding. But to do that, to understand how we are envoys of grace, firstly, we've got to understand the nature of grace and understand the covenant of grace under which we now live. Paul, in answering this question to the Corinthians, why are you so unimpressive, starts to help them understand this, this new covenant of grace. And he gives seven pictures. Now, if you were here last week, you'll know what these seven pictures are. And we're going to have a little bit of a practice. If you weren't here last week, that's okay. You'll clue on very, very quickly. So I wonder, let's, let's to practice. Why don't, we, why don't we all stand up and we're going to use our hands and, and we'll, run, we'll run through the seven pictures from the, from, the, from the bottom to the top. And, 
And I'm sure that you'll, in, in a moment, you'll have um, a full understanding of chapters 2 to 5 of 2 Corinthians. Okay, the first picture was a, a large cup of coffee, a large coffee cup. Yep, do you remember that one? And then in the middle of that was standing up a, a torch. Fantastic, you, you haven't forgotten. And over the top of that was a, a veil. Great, and sitting on top so it doesn't float away was a, a clay pot or a clay jar. Absolutely. And then pitched over the top of the clay pot was a, a tent. In the opening of the tent was a, a globe. And standing on top of the globe was a well-dressed person with a very large hand holding it out to, to shake hands. Okay. All right. So we've got, we've got a, a large coffee cup, a torch, a veil, a clay pot, a tent over the top, a globe in the entrance, and a, and a person with a large hand. Okay. Turn to the person next to you. One of you go through the pictures all the way up from the bottom. The other one go through the pictures all the way down from the, from the top. Okay. You can grab a seat once you're done. Fantastic. These pictures will start to make sense week by week. Last week, we had a look at the coffee cup, and, and that represented what? Does anyone remember that we were the, the aroma of God or the aroma of Christ? We were unto God the aroma of Christ, and, and a coffee cup has or gives off a beautiful aroma. Well, now we're going to look at, well, well, well what's the essence of that aroma, but with a different image? Paul uses actually about eight images over, over these few chapters. We're going to look at, look at seven of them, but... But we are, as to God, the aroma of Christ. Now, we want to have a look at the, the next one. And in the cup of coffee was a torch. And I've got, got a torch here, old, old faithful. And, um, and so that's what it is, standing in the, in the coffee cup. And then, so we'll, we'll, put that, we'll put that there. Is that going to stand up? Stay. Good boy. And then over, over the top of the, the torch was a veil. Now, this is the actual veil from our wedding. And that's my... Fourth lie for the day, actually. <laughs> it's not. But it is a veil. It is a veil. We're going to put that over there, and that's just going to, with the fan, sort of blow in a... It's kind of creating a very dramatic kind of scene up here. All right. Hopefully, I don't step on it. Well, so we've got the torch and the veil. We want to have a look at, look at these, these two pictures that Paul provides us with um, this evening. So the first one, the, the torch. Now, I don't have a, a tricky PowerPoint for you tonight, but... I know that you either have your Bibles with you or you have them memorized. So, so just turn with, with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Maybe you've got a smartphone and you can, can look at that. Don't be distracted by text messages and Facebook. Just. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to have a look at it. We're going to read together verses 4 to 6. Now, don't worry if at first... You know, this is a little, little challenging to get your head around because we're, we're going to unpack this together. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Okay, we're, we're trying to understand the image of the torch. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. All right. The torch. What is Paul talking about here? In verse 4, just listen to verse 4 in the message. God said, light up the darkness, and our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. Let me read that one more time. Chapter 4, verse 4 from the message. God said, light up the darkness, and our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. So here's the, here's the image, or here's the, the picture. Um, uh, just imagine for a moment, it's, it's around 4 a.m., and we've gone out, gone out onto a hill with the, the singular purpose of watching the sunrise together. Now, we're early because we don't want to miss any of it. And as we're standing out there in the darkness, the time comes, a couple of hours later, the time comes where we start to, to see that we, we don't know where the horizon is. It's all just formless and dark, but we start to see what we think just might be a little bit of a light. 
right way, way far away. And, and perhaps that's where the sun's going to rise. And sure enough, it gets brighter and brighter. And, and now we become a little bit convinced. As it rises, we start to see the horizon line more and more clearly. And, and we realize, yes, it is. That's the sun. That's the sun. And, and as, it, as it rises further, it gets lighter. And now we can even see just a little bit of color. But as we look at the horizon, it's, it's disrupted by one, one little stick or pole or post or something. We're not entirely sure what it is. But the more the sun rises, the brighter it gets, the more slowly color creeps into the picture. And it now becomes clear that it is a pole, a very, very large pole that we can, we can see right there on the horizon. The sun rises further and, and it gets brighter. And now the colors are starting to be more vibrant and it's very, very clear. It's a large pole, but no, it's got a cross beam. It actually looks a little bit like a cross. As the sun rises and now sort of, sort of breaches the, the horizon line and, and starts to really bring color to the whole scene, we can see that what first looked like a pole and then a cross is actually a, a person standing very straight with their arms stretched out. And, and we see now that, hey, this is Jesus, isn't it? Not the crucified Jesus on the cross, but the, but the resurrected Jesus there in person, alive and bright and smiling, and, and, it's, and it's Jesus. And the more we look at him, the more we, we suddenly notice that, he's, that his knees are just, just a little bit bent, and he's, that, that cross position is actually the sort of position that a father might have when he's when he's beckoning a child to come, come, come and, come and jump into my arms. Come on, come on, come on, jump. And now we start to see it's the posture of, of the Heavenly Father as if he's beckoning us to come and to run to him and leap into his, his mighty big hands. Well, that's a little bit of what Paul's image is here. He's talking about a light dawning like the sun because, well, there was a... There was, a, 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 I guess, a shortage of torches in those days. I mean, they had torches to speak of and lamps and so forth, but not like we have here. So his image is really of the sun, the, the ultimate light of the sun dawning. And, and as it dawns, it brings color to our life. But more than that, it shows that, that Jesus himself is in our life and a part of our life. And the more that we are able to see Jesus, guess what? We see God. We see God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now in, in verse 6, he, he, he personalizes this a little bit more. Let's have a look at this again. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. This is creation language here. And so now all of a sudden Paul is shifting that image to not just your life, but shifting that whole image or imagery of a light dawning into your very, very heart. If you could open up the window of your heart, you would peer in and, and now this is the view that you would see. You would see a light dawning on your heart and, and bringing it alive. In, in fact, that's important because up until this point, all of a sudden, things are dark and formless. Genesis 1-2 says that, that now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. That was the description of, of what was nothing. God created something out of nothing. What does nothing look like? Well, uh, dark and formless and empty. And the imagery here is very, very powerful. That's what Paul says is the condition of the human heart. Now, this isn't a very popular thing to say nowadays. We, we love to think, don't we, that, that actually, oh no, come on, it's not that bad, Stuart. People are basically pretty good. I mean, look at all the good around the world that there is. Well, yes, by the grace of God. But that's not how God understands the human condition. The human heart is, is actually formless and empty, and dark. Until the, the light of Jesus Christ is, 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 is a light within a person's life, that's the condition of the human heart. Formless, empty, dark. We're all like that. And I'm sorry if that's offensive, but God's words, not, not mine. The good news is, into this darkness, this, this formless void, God speaks, and in the same way that in the beginning he said, let there be light, 
Paul says, God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, now recreates that light to shine in our hearts. It's an amazing picture, isn't it? But this is somebody who is formerly dead coming to life. This is the process of spiritual birth. This is what God is talking about. To enlighten us with knowledge of who God is by revealing the face of Jesus Christ. As that light dawns in our heart, guess who is resident there? Jesus. As it gets brighter and brighter and brighter, we see Jesus more clearly. As we see Jesus more clearly, we come to an understanding of who God is. God's light has dawned in our hearts and now we see Jesus. Now we see God. Now again... This is not that popular nowadays. There is a, a popular teacher and, and author who has been advocating red-letter Christianity, as if to say, all we need is, a, you know, the Bibles that just have the red letters and so forth. All we need is just the red letters, just the words of Jesus. The rest doesn't really matter. You know, anyone who's, who's studied hermeneutics knows how that's going to go very, very wrong very, very quickly, particularly given that Jesus validates the rest of Scripture. But for those who have adopted that red-letter Christianity, they miss something very, very important. Like, for instance, John 14, verse 7. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. Jesus won't be separated from the Father. He won't let us do that. Nowadays, I guess I, I hear from time to time people say, well, I like Jesus and I like what he taught. Well, most of it anyway. But... Uh, but I don't know, I always find God the Father to be a bit of a scary person. Well, Jesus would say, well, you can't separate the two of us out. It's not like that. John 14, verse 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. John 14, verse 10, don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? If you have seen Jesus... You have seen the Father. Do you want to see the face of God? Close your eyes for a moment. Let's try a little exercise. Just imagine, if you can, in your mind's eye, the cutest little baby you've ever come across. Big, bright, dark, inquisitive eyes. And he's there in the arms of his mother, Mary. Now, he's squealing with delight as his father Joseph swings him around and around. Now, he's listening with reverent curiosity as rabbis seek to teach him. Picture him now. Smiling towards heaven as he rises from those baptism waters. And now, on his knees, and again, on his knees, and again, on his knees, and again, on his knees, in fellowship with his father. Now, weeping at Mary's distress over the death of her brother Lazarus. Now, crying out on a cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not in confusion but as a triumphant declaration that David's psalm has found its fulfillment, leaving the echo of what hasn't been spoken, he has not despised the suffering one nor hidden his face from him in the ears of all those who stood at the foot of the cross. Picture him now, beaming with joy as he watches Mary Magdalene's surprise at the empty tomb and a discarded stone, for his father had come to get his boy. All right, you can open your eyes. 
Some find it easy to imagine such things than others, but, but I wonder for a moment, just thinking back to all of those pictures that the Gospels leave us with, did you see the face of Jesus? Maybe not clearly with definition, but did you see something of his heart and who he was? If you did, you've seen the face of God. Some people nowadays, I guess, feel a little bit like, well, Jesus I get, but I just find it hard to have a relationship with God the Father, probably because I don't have a very good relationship with my earthly father. And so um, misunderstanding, perhaps, or, or twisting modern counseling, um, you, and it is easy to do this, you reckon that if I just get my relationship with my earthly father right, well, eventually I will be able to get my relationship with my heavenly father right as well. You want to know something? I don't think that's a spiritual principle. Jesus said, I am the way to the Father. There's no other way. And we can, I think, spend years going around and around and around trying to fix something that actually can only be fixed once we've come to know our Heavenly Father. Scripture seems to, seems to say that that it is through a knowledge of Jesus Christ that we come to know our Heavenly Father and then our Heavenly Father is able to resource us to perhaps, over time, put right our relationship with, if it's not great, our earthly Father. That's kind of turning things around a little bit. But the torch represents the fact that, that a light has dawned in our heart. As we, as we come to believe in Jesus Christ, a light dawns in our heart. And as that happens, we, we see the glory of Christ. We see him for who he really is. And as that happens, we come to know the Father, the Heavenly Father. That's what has happened. That's the, the new covenant of grace that, that we come under. That's the torch, the light that is now so much a part of our lives. But then... There's something else. Remember, Paul is explaining to the, to the Corinthian church why it is that some are alleging he's a very unimpressive character. And he's, he knows about the light of Christ in his life, but he's, but he's trying to help them understand why, well, to at least some people, that might be just a little bit veiled for the time being, why they can't actually see who it is. And so we turn to, turn to chapter 3. Um, again, you have your Bibles, Bibles with you. Have a look here at chapter 3. And we're going to read here verses, just a few verses, verses 12 to 18. And again, if at first glance this doesn't make sense, that's okay. We're going to explore it together. All right, so verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains where the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who, with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. All right, now a little bit of context is needed here, um, but we're talking about the veil now, not the torch, but the veil. My dad was a uh, school teacher, fantastic at telling stories. And around bedtime, he would, he would often tell me a story if I begged and pleaded in the right way. And, and one of my favorites was a little bit of a, an interactive storytelling method that he used. And, and basically, he would, he would give me a fact. He would talk, tell me a, a story which had all sorts of turns for the better and now for the worse. And, and when it got worse, it would turn for the better and then it would turn for the worse and so forth. Now, he would give me a fact which was seemingly good. And I had to respond by saying, well, that's good. And then my dad would say, actually, Stewie, that's bad. I said, oh, that's bad. And then he'd, the story would take a turn for the worse. And I would say, oh, that's bad. He'd say, no, Stewie, that's good. The story would then take a turn for the better. All right, we're going to play that game. All right, I'm going to tell you a story. Now, you have to know your bit. 
It's either going to be, oh, that's good, although that's bad. All right, are you ready for your part? If I give you the thumbs up, guess what you're supposed to say? That's good. That's good. That's good. Yes, that's right. If I give you the thumbs up, you say, that's good. Okay, but you can't do it like that because nobody's lips are moving and no sounds are coming out. All right, we're, we're, so all together now. I'll give you the thumbs up. We're all going to say together, that's good. All right, now if I give you the thumbs down, you're going to say, that's bad. All right, ready for the story? Okay, you got your part? I've got my part. Okay, here we go. And this is the, the preceding verses of this passage, okay? It gives us all a little bit of context. We can understand this. All right, here we go. Having lost sight of God and his ways... Humanity was truly lost. Actually, that's good. You see, Moses regained sight of God and used to soak in his presence often. Actually, that's bad. Why? Well, God's glory left Moses so radiant that the people couldn't bear to look at him. And he had to put a veil over his face. Actually, that's good. Why? Well, after soaking in his presence, Moses once more understood God's ways, and he had the law. Actually, that's bad. Because the law, though glorious as it was, brought condemnation, and we couldn't comply with God's holy ways. Actually, that's good. You see... It was surpassed by the ministry of the Spirit who enables us to live holy lives. That's even more glorious. Actually, that's bad. Because many today cannot understand this. It's like they have a veil over their hearts. Well, actually, that's good. Because whenever someone turns to the Lord, that veil is taken away. And there's more good, all right? (laughs) Once the heart veil is removed, the face veil is removed as well. We can see and we can be seen. And there's more. The more we contemplate the glory of the Lord, the more we reflect the glory of the Lord. We go from glory to glory. That is very good. Well done. That's the trifold good so we can end there. That's good. That's the good news. So that's Paul's little story about the importance of the veil. But basically he's saying that once once the light of God is is switched on in your hearts, Jesus is enough to take away that veil which once hid you from his glory. And we go from glory to glory. We we contemplate Christ and we think, wow, he's... He's glorious, and we worship him, and we exalt him, and we think, you're amazing, Jesus. And then all of a sudden it occurs to us, Jesus, you live within me. You're in my heart. All of that glory and everything that I was just rejoicing in is inside me. We go from glory to glory, and then we get excited, and we think more than we think, this is incredible, Jesus. You live with inside me. And then we worship him more and we, we contemplate him more. We see the face of the, our Father and we realize once more that he lives within us. So we go from glory to glory to glory to glory. And it's this huge, amazing way in which slowly, by contemplating Jesus, we are transformed from within. That's good. That is really, really good. Yes, indeed. And this is Paul's argument here. Now, Just going back and recapping on one of the sad parts here. Back in chapter 4, we did read, and you may have read this, and we did read, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Um, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Now, we know that we live in a world where not everybody sees our identity. Not everybody sees the glory that God sees. Not everybody sees who we are. Not everybody understands spiritual things. Why? Because the God of this age has blinded them. He's put a, put a veil over the light so that they can't see the way that they should. As an illustration of this, um, I, I'm passing um, through a bookshop the other day, and I saw a book by Christopher Hitchens, God is Not Great. Now, Christopher Hitchens is a, is a, was a mate of Richard, Richard Dawkins, a, um, an, an atheist, an outspoken atheist. 
Um, sadly, he, he died about four years ago in 2011. But before he died, he brought out a book called God is Not Great. And as I was walking, walking past it, I, I smiled to myself because I, I kind of thought, uh-huh. Um, and, and I thought, why wouldn't I buy that book? Or maybe Richard Dawkins' book, or basically any of those books. And my answer was, as I was walking away, was, well, because I, I can't heal the blind. There is a sense in which, unfortunately, atheists are, are simply captive to the fact that the God of this age has blinded them. Stuart Hunt can't heal that. I cannot give, spiritually speaking, sight to the blind. Only God can do that. Would I be willing to buy the books and engage with the arguments and so forth? Yeah, if it was helpful and I felt that that was a good, good use of my time, I wouldn't have a problem with that. But would I actually think that I'm going to have an impact on Richard Dawkins or, or some other prominent atheist? Well, no, not particularly. Why? Because I don't know that anyone has ever lost an argument and been won to the kingdom. I can't bring sight to the blind. Now, thinking about Christopher Hitchens' book, God is Not Great, if he's right, if Christopher Hitchens is right, and there's, there is nothing after this life, then he himself is no more. It's over. He's gone. And his words actually have gone with him. And in keeping with his philosophy to, to not trust that which doesn't exist, well, I would have to say, I don't believe him because he doesn't exist. If he's wrong, now if he's right, he's no more, and I can't believe him because he doesn't exist. If he's wrong, then the Bible is clear. There are two possibilities here. If he is wrong, there is the possibility that he was a late recipient of grace, because who knows what goes through a person's mind in the, in the final minutes of their life. It's possible he was a late recipient of God's grace, and right now he is present with God. But there is a second possibility, of course, and that is that he was a resistor of God's grace, and he is forever apart from God. Either way, he now knows that God is indeed great. But how much better would it be to come to that realization in this lifetime? Paul bemoans the fact that there are some people for whom the gospel is veiled, the God of this age has, has blinded them. You and I know people who are in that very, very situation, and it is, it is actually quite painful. We take no joy in the fact that they, they cannot understand spiritual things. And the temptation for us is to actually do what was happening in Corinth. That is to, to tweak the gospel, to make it a little bit more palatable, to make it a little bit more digestible. Well, if the gospel we first presented to you, if the claims were too radical and the Jesus of that gospel just seemed to say things that made you feel uncomfortable, what if I tweak it a little bit and reinterpret it a little bit so that, so that it becomes a little bit easier for you to enjoy? We might try to build bridges to such people and, and to kind of, well, I guess, make the whole thing a little bit more liberal and, and easy for people to, to digest. Mark Gulley is the editor for Christianity Today, and he was responding to Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, which, which kind of flirts with universalism. And, and Mark's comment was simply this, it was to, you know, right there in the title, a bridge too far. On this one, Rob Bell has built a bridge too far. In other words, he's watered down the fundamental biblical message of the gospel in trying to make it more palatable for non-Christians. The result is that we, we distort the truth. And this was happening in Corinth. That's why Paul says in, in chapter 4, he says, but we don't lose heart about those who are not able to understand. We don't lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. He wouldn't go there. A.W. Tozer writing back in the 40s and the 50s, was, was talking about a very man-centered Christianity back then. He says, The image of God, currently popular, is that of a distracted father struggling in heartbroken desperation to get people to accept a savior of whom they feel no need and in whom they have very little interest. To persuade these self-sufficient souls to respond to his generous offers, 
this God that is often preached, this God will do almost anything, even using salesmanship methods and talking down to them in the chummiest way imaginable. He says what happens when we water down the gospel that way, what happens is that we only manage to make men the star of the show. And Paul was saying, oh, I'm not going to do that. You might feel that you know, others are tickling your ears and they're kind of super apostles and I'm just, I'm just kind of, you know, so yesterday in terms of my message, but I'm sticking to it. And Paul has a little bit of a formula for those of us who are struggling with the lost, for those who don't know, who are currently blinded by the God of this age because there is a veil over their hearts. And, and when we struggle, here is, here is his encouragement to us. Firstly, in verse 2 of chapter 4, he says, We have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience, conscience in the sight of God. Paul is basically saying, stand firm. Don't compromise. Stand firm on what you know. Stand firm on the truth. It will amaze you. We, we, we live in a in a day, in an age which is increasingly represented by people who are hungry for truth. It's funny. We are offering people whatever they want, literally, or whatever you want. Whatever truth you want, you can have it. And do you know what the, the opposite reaction is of people? Oh, I'm not comfortable with that. I actually, I actually need something a little different to my imagination of what is truth, I need real truth. I need a touch of reality. People are hungry for it. And when you stand your ground, when you refuse to budge, people see they're not comfortable with that at first, but they do see something that is, that is different. But Paul is saying, hold to the truth there. Hold to the word of God. And then in chapter 3, verse 16, he gives us this encouragement. He says, Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. He says it again in verse 18. Um, we, uh, all with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed into, into his image. Jesus, when a heart turns towards him, is able to take the veil away. He is able. Have confidence in Jesus. He's very, very good at what he does. Yes, there is a veil. Yes, the God of this age has blinded them. Yes, they cannot see the truth. But Jesus has the capacity to remove that veil when hearts are turned towards him. So pray. Pray that people's hearts would turn towards God. And then in verses um, 12 and 13, Paul says this, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face. Lastly, he contrasts himself with Moses. Moses used to hide the, the glory because people couldn't stand it with a veil. Paul says, no, not us. Not with this glory. It's too good to hide. No, we don't put a veil over it. We're actually rather bold about it. We actually want everybody to see it. We want them to see the, the glory of Christ. Don't veil his glory that is within you. The glory of Christ is within you. Don't veil it. Don't cover it up. Don't be one of those undercover Christians. Don't kind of just mix it up with people so that they actually you know, aren't offended anymore and are going to call you on various stands that you take. Let that light within you shine. You know the, the, old, the old song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Don't veil it. Don't cover it up. Don't be afraid. Don't compromise. Let people see who you really are, because then they will see who Christ really is, and then they will see who God the Father really is. We, we live in a very, very strategic moment in terms, of, in terms of world history and the second coming of Christ. I would describe it this way. Um, we just uh, went away and celebrated our 27th wedding anniversary. I really wish you could be there. Um, we, we just had a lovely, lovely time away and, and time of re reflecting over God's goodness to us for 27 years and, and even reminisced a little bit. Now, I can still remember, I really can, 
of the day when Bron, Bron came down the aisle, she was veiled. And of course, I didn't know who it was. Who is that? <laughs> no, I did. I actually had a heads up. Um, and, and she came down and there were attendants with her and, and it was, she looked beautiful. And the dress, I hadn't been able to see it. This was the first time I'd seen her in a wedding dress. And, and then she joined me on stage. And then I got to see what nobody else got to see. The, the, veil, the veil was removed. And, and so now we are just looking at each other for the, for the first time on that particular day. The veil's removed and I could look into her eyes and the eyes are a window to the soul. And I could just see the joy in her and the excitement. This was such a special day for her. But then it was for me as well. And she could see, as she looked into my eyes, the nerves, <laughs> but, but beyond the nerves, the joy and the excitement for me as well. And, and then I could see that she could see the joy and the excitement, and she could see that I could see her joy and the excitement. It was kind of just bouncing off each other. And we stand at that particular moment. You know, the church is often described as the bride of Christ, isn't it? And I know that this gets a bit tricky for guys to picture, but, but there is a sense in which, in terms of, in terms of the scheme of things, this is the moment that we are at. We are standing before Christ and the veil has been removed. We're not back at the church like the wedding hasn't started. The bride has marched forth. The bride has come and, and we are unveiled. And it's like Christ looks at his church and, and he sees who she really is. And she can see that Christ sees who she really is. And, and, and he can see that she sees that, and, and it's kind of like going glory to glory to glory to glory. It's, it's the more that Christ speaks into us and says, I know who you really are, and I can see the joy and the excitement in you. I can see myself in you. And then the bride responds like, yeah, I'm seeing it more and more. This is real, isn't it? You really do dwell within each of us, this collective of individuals within whom the light of your, your grace is shining. And now we see you and I can see that, that, that this is who I am. And I can see that you see that. And, and we go from glory to glory. And slowly as we come to understand this more and more, the, the image of Christ within us, we're transformed. We start to believe more and more. Faith rises and we, we start to really believe what it is that Jesus says about us. From glory to glory. We as a church stand in, in that moment. And that changes everything. The rest of the world doesn't necessarily see it. That's okay. This is a private moment, spiritually speaking. Jesus sees it, and that's all that's important. But the transformation that takes place in us is something that the world notices. They do. And slowly, as we pray and as we plead and intercede and say, Lord, I'm not moving, I'm not shifting from this stand. Here I am, I can do no other. In that moment, God is able to use that to turn hearts towards him and to also remove the veil so that his light can shine in their hearts as well. That's the torch. That's the veil. Let's pray. Hmm. Oh, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this imagery and these are profound concepts, but here it is. A picture of what your grace means to bring to life a dark and formless heart with the light of your life and your presence within. This is what it means to live the unveiled life, unveiled glory where others get to see who we really are in you and therefore who you really are. And what a privilege. Who, who are we for such a task? What a privilege to live such lives. And we can only do this empowered by your spirit. And so we, we thank you for the promise of your precious Holy Spirit bringing life to our soul. 
Let it be, Lord. And more and more as people, people see your glory within us, would hearts be turned towards you and veils removed. We ask this in your name. Amen.